how long do you anticipate to present? Hi, um, Mr. Chair. I. Uh, I believe Mrs. Marcellos is on the line. Yes, I am. Uh, so good evening. Oh, uh, yeah. Did, Frida, but would you be... Did you start already, or...? No, we haven't started yet, Frida, but we were letting the presenters into the room. Uh, would you be willing to uh, start the meeting off with a prayer tonight? I could do that. Okay, we're ready. I will call this public hearing of the Standing Committee of Government Operations to order. Uh, as is our custom, I will ask uh, Emily Marcellos if you could open our meeting with a prayer. Mr. Chair, uh, Lord, give us a love for others that understands and accepts them as they are. And mirrors your love for us, plant and nourish within us your unconditional love. 
which overcomes all obstacles to friendship and and seeks nothing in return. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Madam Chair, or Emily Marcellos. Uh, I'd like to thank all members and those who have joined us in today's virtual Zoom meeting. Uh, committee made the decision with the recent Omicron outbreak to, to hold this public hearing virtually. Uh, although we do have plans to attend f- further hearings and are always open to receiving any written submissions from those either in the room or watching on the various Legislative Assembly pages. Um, the committee of the standing government operations i think says a lot in that we early on in our assembly selected one committee which was to increase the indigenous representation in the public service uh, this is part of many much of the work we we're doing but our goal tonight is to receive input from members of the public and i thank everyone who has signed up tonight uh, we will take this information we, we are mostly here to listen and then we will ask some clarifying questions and that information will be brought forward a number of ways ultimately in a report on the floor of the legislature and in subsequent meetings with minister of finance and staff responsible in the gnwt uh tonight's presenters we have six signed up we will start with mr dennis nelner followed by desiree bidberichinski crystal lenny catherine beckham Pam, and then representatives from the fort state metis led by their president uh, if you would like to provide written submissions, or if you uh, were intending to speak tonight, but I did not just read your list out, your name out there, just uh, simply message the Zoom chat and our, our clerk will work to add you to the list. Uh, I'll, I'll begin tonight's meeting by allowing the members of the committee to introduce themselves and if they wish, just say a few opening remarks about this priority and this public hearing, uh, beginning with MLA Cleveland. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and welcome to all of our presenters. I really look forward to um, listening this evening and learning, and I'd like to thank each of you for taking time from your schedules to be here this evening. Thank you. Caitlin Cleveland, Emily Kamlik. Uh, and I probably should start. I am Rylan Johnson, the MLA for Yellowknife North and uh, co-chair of this committee along with Emily Marcel. Uh, next, I'll turn it over to our next member of the com- committee, uh, MLA Sen. Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Lisa Semler. I'm the MLA for Inuvik Twin Lakes. Um, I'm of Inuvialuit and Gwich'in uh, descent. And uh, one of the things that we've heard the most working in the Northwest Territories is affirmative action. Um, And the issues behind this policy um, and increasing Indigenous representation in Northwest Territories. So as this committee, like we said, this is one of our prior, this is our only priority for this committee to try and move this um, this target um, where it's been sitting at a low percentage of Indigenous representation in the government workforce for as long as this policy has been in place. So I'm glad to be here and to be listening to all the presenters. Thank you. Thank you, Emily Semler. And lastly, uh, Emily Marcellus, if you could introduce yourself. Emily Marcellus, a member for Tabacha. Uh, I'm the uh, Deputy Chair now of Government Operations, and, um, uh, you know, I'm very pleased to be here tonight. I'm a strong advocate for change in the, in the, in the, uh, for, um, in the political uh, arena with regards to this very, um, with uh, the Indigenous Recruitment and Retention uh, Policy. Um, I am for change and to ensure that representation from both uh, uh, Indigenous uh, representation and all those uh, that were born here. Because uh, right now we don't have that representation within the uh, the bureaucratic uh, regime. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emily Martz-Fellows. Uh, So just uh, a few notes on process. Uh, Each of our presenters is allocated 20 minutes to present tonight, and then there'll be some clarifying questions if desired by members of the committee. Uh, I'm hoping that we can land this public hearing to end right around 9 o'clock so everyone can get the rest they need. Uh, And and lastly, just as it is a committee meeting and a formal public hearing, I would ask that uh, all questions and comments go through the chair. So 
uh, there's a bit of a, a process where I will I will thank the person asking the question and then refer the question to myself. Uh, and without further ado, I will turn it over to our first presenter tonight, and that is Mr. Uh, Den Mr. Dennis Nelner. Mr. Nelner, the the floor is yours. Thank you for taking the time to present for, to us. Thank you very much. Um, I have a uh, PowerPoint presentation. Is that going to be um, uh, displayed on Zoom here? Yes, Madam Clerk, one second. I will ask that our clerk uh, go ahead and try and share that PowerPoint presentation. Okay, I'll wait. Okay. Hey. Hmm. One second. I had just had it up here, and now I've. No, I don't. No. Okay. All right, one second. There we go. Can you see it? Yes, I can see it. Okay. Just let me know when you want me to turn the page and we're off. Okay, well, we can go to the next slide. Okay. Oh, was there one uh, that said intro? There it is. Okay, slide number two. All right, I'll get started now. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to be here virtually tonight. Thank you for inviting me to make a presentation. I hope everyone is doing well and enjoying the good weather today. I uh, requested an invite to the standing committee meeting on recruitment and, and, and retention of Aboriginal people. I was uh, initially shocked after reading a post from Mr. Johnson on Facebook that there was interest in this topic and a call out for uh, public opinion. I felt compelled to attend because we need to help bring awareness to the problems of maintaining a public workforce that is representative of the people they serve. I am the perfect person to help this assembly zero in on the specific areas that need attention and fixing as uh, Aboriginal male employee for the Department of Finance for the last seven years. I have served in the role of shop steward for the UNW Local 13 in Fort Simpson. I am currently the Dacho Regional, uh, Regional Vice President serving Local 13 and Local 31. And I have also had my own personal experiences dealing with systemic barriers, gaslighting, and workplace racism. As a new union executive, I had the opportunity to uh, attend recently a PSAC equity conference. I wanted to broaden my network at a, la at a national level, um, uh, listen to the stories uh, from other members across the country, and I find that there's common themes here in the North. Listening to other members, I found concerns about the employer that there are common denominators, common themes, especially with our Indigenous Aboriginal public servants. As an Aboriginal advocate, it is my duty, but also my pleasure to help bring awareness to this committee so that you may focus your attentions on the matter of systemic barriers and racism in the workplace. Focus on where the barriers are, how the rules are broken, and by addressing these issues, we can start to increase Aboriginal people numbers in the workforce. Next slide, please, Cynthia. Is there fair dispute resolution? As an Aboriginal employee, I explored all avenues checked, staffing appeals, hiring committees, all the interview scores have to be the same. You can't uh, be independent. Re staffing review officers, they're uh, contractors and they won't go against uh, employer decisions. HR help desk creates a record with call out number However, no authority just gives a heads up to the senior official in question. Grievances, union led, long cumbersome process. Workplace harassment, calls out specific person or persons, but through omission of evidence, the individual is usually exonerated. Safe disclosure of information. That's the collective agreements version of whistleblower protection. In practice, too many loose ends, people not doing their jobs. Human Rights Commission, same as the union, long cumbersome process. 
Workers Advisor Office, as the name implies, it's just an advisory role and is an offset of the uh, WSCC. Ombuds Office, affirmative action is off the table. It's all about process. Uh, MLA and union, not allowed oversight in the hiring process. Lobby ineffective unless you're an executive council prerogative. Uh, Minister of Finance, lobby is based on nepotism and political appointment versus people who have the skills. So in isolation, these processes don't work because they're heavily weighted against the employee. I have an asterisk there, uh, Minister of Finance Office is in charge of Human Resource Division and the implementation of the Affirmative Action Policy, i.e. prerogative of Executive Council. Next slide, please. We might have went one too far. Okay. Yep. Mechanisms employed by senior management. The intensity and brashness from senior managers after filing a complaint increases. It begins with micromanaging, overreach, bypassing supervisor and office manager, retaliation, withholding benefits, uh, financial reprisals, uh, suspensions without pay, constructive dismissal, one, two, three strikes, you're out. Forced out the door, there's a cat and mouse game. You begin to lose focus. The daily routine is nonstop bullying, abuse of authority, skipping steps. It all culminates to your tolerance as an employee and your ability to balance this abuse to your need to maintain an economic livelihood in the North. Next slide, please. Toxic work culture. Uh, failure to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion. Workers are being disrespected, unethical behavior, low integrity, abusive managers, and cutthroat environment. By failing to recognize high performance, not only are you losing people at a higher rate, but you're losing people who are highly valuable to the public workforce. Next slide, please. Mechanisms employed by senior manager, quote unquote, inappropriate behavior mantra is a means of gaslighting indigenous Aboriginal experiences, uh, exploiting cultural differences, and a distraction from the workplace issue the employee is bringing forth for fair and impartial uh, resolution. Allegations of, an, of uh, inappropriate behavior are usually leading up to suspension or dismissal. Omission is just another form of lying. It's to influence the decision at a higher level. Abuse of authority by refusing to include important evidence that provides additional context that would may influence the decision in favor of the employee. That evidence is usually uh, suppressed. Uh, one thing that I've noticed is the management incentive policy, which is a monetized incentive for senior managers, but it is also a gateway entry to mismanagement of public funds gross mismanagement, and deviation from standards, guidelines, and policies. Next slide, please. Affirmative action policy. No oversight of the hiring process. A hands-off approach. Recruiting is relegated to HR and the hiring department only. Regular MLAs and union cannot do anything to influence or provide uh, direction. The finance minister's office, uh, I have that in quote, that's taken directly from the affirmative action policy, represents the executive council on affirmative action matters external to the public service. If the minister was doing its job in theory, NWT representation by population is 50% Aboriginal people, 50% white people and others. HR by practice does not follow affirmative action policy. It fails to promote, hire, train, and advance in Aboriginal males. Hiring is done largely in part by appointment only. Affirmative action policy has been changed to discriminate by gender. Before it was priority one uh, candidates were 
Indigenous Aboriginal people. Now it's altered to uh, Priority 1A and Priority 1B. This has had a devastating effect on Aboriginal males in the public workforce. Next slide, please. The prerogative of Executive Council. Exe Executive Council has altered the affirmative action in September 2006. Those legislative changes have altered the hiring practices of HR. It has changed towards a feminist movement and an inclusionary other policy versus affirmative action policy and the merit principle. That discriminates against Aboriginal males. In practice, when two candidates, uh, Aboriginal female, Aboriginal male, apply for the same job, it will always be the Aboriginal female that will get the that will be the successful candidate. If there is no other Aboriginal people candidates, then other candidates are hired. In either case, there is no consideration for Aboriginal males in either one, any of these cases. In fact, an undocumented list is accumulated of all those Aboriginal people that continue to apply for employment with the government and are never hired. Um, I recall a Facebook post from uh, Mr. Johnson stating that there was a job posting on a Friday and closed uh, that following Monday. And that was, I don't know, to show the, the appointed candidate has formally applied for the job. Other deceptive tactics are used by HR to um, go outside of the formal hiring processes, skipping steps. Next slide, please. In theory, this is how our workforce should look like. 50% Aboriginal, 50% other, okay? Next slide, please. In reality, this is what our workforce looks like. We have, um, and, and all this information here was taken from the last public service report, annual report that is produced by the government every year. Okay, so all this information uh, is taken from that report. And it shows uh, Aboriginal uh, males at the lowest uh, representation in the history of the NWT. This is the legacy that you guys have to, uh, and that's your guys' legacy. We're at the lowest point we've ever been in our entire history. Next slide, please. This uh, slide here is just the numbers. It's a uh, another representation other than a pie chart. But if you look at the numbers, the numbers tell you a story. It says right there, um, you know, every time that the government um, increases uh, the workforce by over 5%, it's at the detriment of Aboriginal males. And you can see in 2014, we uh, our numbers dipped below 10% for the first time in the history of NWT. And then you look at the last two years, 2019, 2020, the public workforce grew by 16%. Aboriginal uh, males did not uh, stay on pace with that 16% growth rate. In actual fact, we went down our numbers. So you can look at it. There's 527 uh, Aboriginal males in the workforce. What it should be in theory is 1,563. So we're out by 1,040. Um, so numbers tell a story. Next slide, please. In conclusion, steps to enact changes to the hiring practices that will improve recruitment and retention, uh, that's more inclusive of the 50% natural born NWT citizens that represent the NWT workforce and population. So step one, under international law, UN DRIP, Aboriginal people have a human right to, economic, uh, to an economic livelihood. That should be the new mantra not inappropriate behavior as a means to uh, use the cultural differences against our, our members. We need balance in the workforce. Cost-saving benefits will follow. Cost-saving benefits, less social funding, less social spending, less justice spending, more personal income taxes collected, more disposable income spent in the North. That's what we get when we have a balanced workforce. 
we have to allow oversight from our MLAs and union regarding any deviation from hiring practices for Aboriginal people. We have to remove the 2006 changes to affirmative action policy and instill the merit principle. If you have more experience, more knowledge, and you did good in the interview, then you should be the successful candidate. It shouldn't be based on gender alone. No more loopholes, no more skipping steps for HR. Senior managers should be given hiring targets and not allowed to skip steps in the hiring process. And finally, enact the affirmative action policy. The, minister, the finance minister's office is too ill-equipped to enforce or administer the, the affirmative action policy. And that, ladies and gentlemen, concludes my PowerPoint presentation. If there are any questions, I'll be glad to try and answer them. Thank you very much, Masi Cho. Thank you very much, Mr. Nelner, for your uh, presentation. I'll, I'll turn it over to my committee members. Are there any questions for Mr. Nelner? Uh, MLA Cleveland, go ahead. Thank you very much, and thank you very much to Mr. Nelner for his presentation this evening. I really appreciate you taking the time to join us, and I really appreciate the way that you organized your presentation this evening as well. Um, my, my question is in regards to, um, like you pointed out, that the data doesn't lie. We have, the GNWT has lost a um, significant number of um, male Indigenous Aboriginal uh, public servants within the GNWT. And so I'm wondering if you can speak to, given your experience uh, working with the union, what processes the GNWT can put in place to further protect uh, Indigenous employees in the workplace? Thank you. Hmm. Okay, good question. Um, I think what the, the union's role is, uh, is uh, you know, uh, another thing that we have to look at. Uh, I didn't uh, bring it here as a, as a topic for discussion, but it certainly has a role to play in how our members are treated and how uh, we can, uh, you know, find ways of dispute resolution. And if you refer to that, uh, I think it was the third slide there, um, um, all the different dispute mechanisms that are in place do not um, help uh, the employee at all. As a matter of fact, they're heavily weighted against the employee. And grievances with the union, that's where the union comes in. Uh, those, those processes, uh, grievances can last, uh, you know, any, any amount of time. You know, I've seen people, uh, disgruntled employees, you know, five years waiting for a grievance uh, process. And, and you know, it, it should be, you know, because I've had in some experiences an individual that was rewarded uh, uh, lost pay. And that, uh, you know, um, you know, where was the union? Why, why is it the arbitrator that had to come up with that decision? Where was the union in this case management process? So I think there's differences uh, or there's problems with case management and obviously the amount of grievances that have grown over a period of time, uh, employees feel that uh, the union is letting them down. You know, we have to find ways to uh, get the union to be more reactive case management. Um, and I think uh, how we uh, process the administration of grievances. It's, there's still, you know, lots of work to be done on, on the union end. And same with uh, Human Rights Commission. It's another long, cumbersome process. But again, you get to an adjudicator and somewhere in there, there's a fair you know, um, uh, resolution. There's an adjudicator that is you know, arm's length and you know, generally wants, uh, genuinely wants to get the, you know, the work, uh, uh, the problem solved. So, there you go. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Uh are there any other further questions from committee members? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, no, uh, Mr. Chair, um, uh, that was a very interesting uh, presentation. I want to thank uh, Dennis Neller for, Neller for uh, presenting it. 
Uh, so that's mm-hmm. one of the biggest barriers, I think, uh, is the when uh, a, a disgruntled employee goes to the union, and um, if the if the management of any department wants to get rid of an employee, they find all kinds of reasons how they can do it, and the union is, is too slow. I hear that in especially in my region, my community. And I agree with you there, and I'm just wondering if you have any solutions or are you trying to work from the union point of view so that we can, um, they could be represented properly before they're dismissed? Because this happens yeah. all the time. I hear mm-hmm. about it all the time. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Sarah. Go ahead, Mr. Nolan. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Yes, um, you know uh, what I find, and, and, and I'm a new member to the uh, union executive, whether people like it there or not is another question. But, you know, I, I ask hard questions, and I'm not afraid to do that. And, I, and you know, I said, you know, like, if we are to uh, uh, help uh, Aboriginal people, then I think we should have a staff, uh, even at the union, that is representative of the people that they serve. We need more Indigenous uh, uh, service officers. We don't have any. And I think a lot of problems is that there is um, cross-cultural differences. You know, um, um, a lot of times, uh, uh, especially Aboriginal people, they don't like to uh, re- uh, uh, re-address issues that uh, keep coming up over and over again um, because I feel like, uh, you know, we keep repeating our story over and over again. You know, if you had an Indigenous Aboriginal uh, service officer, you can kind of bypass that because there's a common understanding between uh, employee and and, uh, and, uh, the union member. So I think that's one, one area of dealing with that. And then we also have to, uh, you know, bring to, uh, you know, bring to to attention and awareness of of the issues that are going on in the workplace. Um, you know, um, I think that that in itself, uh, what do you call it, political action or what have you? There's got to be a, uh, con- a concerted effort from the union to have an, an Aboriginal uh, political uh, action voice. I think those would, would help uh, increase uh, the um, or, or, or reduce some of the problems that we have. Thank you. Thank you much. Thank you very much, Mr. Nome, for your answers and uh, your mm-hmm. presentation. Uh, seeing no further questions from the committee, I will go to our next presenter tonight, which is, uh, let me just pull up my list here, uh, Ms. Desiree Pidborczynski. Uh, Ms. Pedverichinsky, uh, the line is yours. Go ahead with your presentation. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and thanks for allowing me to be here. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to speak. And thank you, um, Dennis, tough act to follow. <laughs> I really appreciate um, the presentation that you put together. There was a lot of content. It's clear that this is near and dear to your heart and you have a lot to say. And I think um, you made some really valid points tonight. And um, I don't think that it's falling on deaf ears, but I'm happy to be standing here alongside you um, for this opportunity. I too was excited to see that there was a call for public participation. So it's a wonderful opportunity. I have just a couple of points to speak to tonight. I don't have a fancy presentation. Um, The first point that I wanted to speak to is about recruitment of of Indigenous employees to the GNWT. I've worked for the GNWT for 12 years now, and I am a P1 Indigenous female applicant. Um, My mother's side, Abenaki from Quebec. Um, One of the things that I noticed um, not just in jobs that I applied to, but in that I see throughout the GNWT careers website is that there's always this, the asks. So um, the ideal uh, education that we'd like to have, the ideal experience that we'd like to have. And then there's this clause that speaks to equivalency. So equivalent education and experience. But what I have yet to see is a transparent model for what is considered an equivalency. And my understanding is that HR has 
an understanding somewhere that somebody made up along the way of what these equivalencies are, but it's not transparent. It's nowhere that can be found for applicants. And I think that one part of making um, jobs accessible to Indigenous applicants and particularly those that might not have the education or experience that are ideal to have um, is defining those those things so that people can, if they're working towards getting into careers with the GNWT, plan so that they can get that experience and that those equivalencies. And I also think that it would just bring greater transparency for hiring. So my personal experience has been that um, I've been beat out by other applicants that had the ideal qualifications for the role, but I don't think that enough weight or consideration was given to these equivalencies or what could be considered equivalencies. So if another Indigenous applicant had the ideal education or experience, I'm not sure, and even if it was not an Indigenous applicant, I've been beat out by P2 applicants, and the logic I was given from HR was that, well, they had the ideal qualifications that we were looking for. So then I question, well, who was considering equivalency and where's my opportunity to, to have that reviewed as a P1 applicant? So I think that that's something that requires some greater oversight and some greater transparency um, from HR, and that's across GNWT. And not only making those decisions transparent and making those equivalencies transparent. But then I think that there's a larger conversation to be had, particularly for entry level positions is, are those qualifications, is that degree really necessary to do that job? I think that we see a lot of qualified Indigenous people in the North that have a plethora of experience and particularly working in their own communities. And they might not have like I said, the degree or the diploma or whatnot, but they might have some equivalent experience. And I think that really we need to be looking at, is that degree necessary? If somebody is able to, you know, care for their family in a manner where they're flourishing, could they not also do other, you know, social work type roles? Is is it really necessary to have that stipulation of education and who's making that decision? So that's, I think, something for consideration. And Ultimately, also, it boils down to accessibility of these jobs. If you're looking to recruit more Indigenous applicants, it speaks that you need to have these positions available in the communities where the Indigenous applicants are located. It doesn't help to, to have all the services available in Yellowknife. And I know that, you know, I see some, some heads nodding, and I know that this is a point that's been raised by several of the MLAs here today. And um, I appreciate, you know, hearing it raised time and again, but the decentralization of government services is going to be essential um, if we are to recruit more Indigenous applicants into the GNWT. So that's my piece on recruitment, and I do speak quickly, so I will make sure to send some notes afterwards. Um, the second portion that I'd like to speak to is about employee retention, Indigenous employee retention. Having worked in GNWT for 12 years, I still do not have supervisory experience. And there's a reason for this. I worked I worked in an area where there was training that was required in order to move up. And often interdepartmental training does not go out to competitions. This is internalized within the department. Those training opportunities have been given to friends of friends and you know there's that internal nepotism that that goes on that's so difficult to control on an HR level um, when there's so much discretion and flexibility given to um, give, given to directors given to managers across the board um, 12 years is your supervisor experience as a p1 female applicant is really a tough pill to swallow when you try to move up in your career later I think that what needs to happen is more HR oversight on applying the affirmative action policy as it is, but also, you know, with Mr. Nelner's considerations, is this being applied to the internal training opportunities that are going to become requirements for the full-time positions when they come available? If we, we want to re if retain Indigenous staff, they need to feel valued and they need to know that they're going to be able to move up into those positions. People like to feel that, that they're heard, that they're um, valued employees and in order to do that you need to really invest in those employees and they need to know that when opportunities come available they're going to be available to them too not just to whomever is the preference of the manager in the, in the department so I think that that's really something to consider from my experience the burden has fallen on an employee to make appeals after the fact and as I already spoke to you know I as a P1 can appeal a position and 
there's not necessarily a fulsome conversation about why the decision was made the way it was. You might get the answer that we received the ideal qualification. Somebody had more experience than you or someone had, you know, the degree that we were looking for. But again, I question, you know, if you have an Indigenous applicant against a, a P2 applicant, then why are you not considering the equivalencies and who's making those judgment calls? So I, I want to just stress that point. I think that's really important. I think it's important to have flexibility and it's important to have some discretion when you're hiring employees, but at the same time, too much of it just gets too out of hand. And I think that that's what we're seeing now is that Indigenous applicants are not getting the positions and Indigenous employees, their satisfaction rate is falling because they're not able to get the training they need to move up and to be and to feel valued in their workplaces. So those are the points that I had to speak to. I think I'm in around the five minute mark. So I appreciate you um, following along with my fast talking. And again, I, I just, I wanna say that I'm really grateful for this opportunity um, for public engagement on this, issue, on this issue. I think it's a really important issue. I've been personally affected by it and I know several others that have been too. And I think that everyone's here to try to um, address that. And I do think that we have some, some great folks on the MLA side in this committee. So again, thank you all for being here and for allowing me to participate. Thank you very much for presenting Ms. Pedroszynski. Uh, points for a uh, fastest speaker. And if, and if you could share any notes you have with uh, our committee click, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, and uh, MLAs? I see Emily Semler has a question. Go ahead, Emily Semler. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, first, I just want to say thank you to Ms. Pitbajinski for her 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 points. Um, you're you're speaking you're speaking what most of us are talking about. What we when we sit in the minute meetings with our Minister of HR, these are the same issues that we are raising not just on the floor, but in behind closed doors, trying to push change in the way that we are um, doing this work from through our committee. Um, like you said, the equivalencies that has been raised by us, like <laughs> show us show us something, even show us how you do this. So um, I'm glad that this is a public briefing and I know that the HR department and the people that write policy are going to be listening and watching and it's not just it this is this is the issue. This is the issue that's been happening for so long. Um, and when you say it's affected you personally, it's affected me personally as an indigenous woman, you know, working in a frontline position for many years. I'm not sure how many people have taken the emerging managers and had to pay for it themselves, like I did. Most of the people that I sat in that that room with were non-Indigenous and were paid by their employer. I had to, only way I got to go is if I was able to cover the cost myself. And that's because I put my neck out there because I wanted to move up, but nobody wanted to help me. And so that is why we're here today making this a priority because we have see, we see that this government is not a representation, our public service is not a representation of our population. And so I want to thank you for your presentation today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Emily. Uh, any response, Ms. Pedrojinski? I just want to thank you for that. Um, I, I do know that there's good work being done behind the scenes and I have faith that it will continue to happen. I think the right people are on this committee to make positive change if it can be done. And um, And I didn't want to just, you know, send an email and behind the scenes stuff. I really feel like it's important that if somebody's able to speak to these issues and has the experience that they need to do so and in a public way so that they know that they're not alone. So I appreciate you sharing your experience as well. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any other further questions from committee members? Chair? Go ahead, Emily Martinez. Emily Martinez. Uh, I want to thank the presenter for the presentation. It was very honest and it came from the heart. Um, you no, know, and I, I know about equivalencies are, is a problem. It's a problem all over the north. It's not only where you are, it's throughout the whole uh, um, affirmative action policy. They're not following it. I know that for sure because I see that even in the community that I'm representing. And one of the things that I wanted to ask you was... Uh, the, about the appeal pro, pro, uh, process. 
One of the one of the um, uh, main things that I always get is that um, uh, earlier years they knew who got the dog, okay, and then there was the appeal process of five days or something like that that you could appeal. So you would know who's the person that got the job, and you would know that if you were equivalent or you felt that you could do a better job than that person and the person appealed, they don't give you that name anymore. And so most, there's no more appeals hardly. And the appeal process, even if you appeal, they've already given the job to that other person, they just stick with it. Have you ever heard that complaint? Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, Ms. Pipertensky. I've certainly been the person making that complaint. Um, I can only speak from my own experience and um, I don't think that the conversation that's had with HR during the appeals process is fulsome enough and I don't think that it's transparent enough. Um, and I, I echo your concern, um, Emily and Marcellos, that um, I, they don't give the name anymore and to me the name is less important but I find that it does turn it back to the employee and puts the burden on the employee to be able to ask the probing questions that they need to ask to get the information that they need and not everyone's able to, to do that and I, I really think you know questions I was asking is was this a P1 applicant that was successful was it a P2 what were their credentials and you don't always get all the information so um, and then they do just you end up sticking with their with their position that they started with and um, one response that I got was well we gave more discretion to the hiring manager and I think that that's a problem I think that you know HR should have the final word and HR should be doing their own reviews about was affirmative action policy followed and to what extent was it followed and was it followed in the spirit that it's meant to be followed when you're considering affirmative action and that goes back to the equivalencies I think so thank you for the question. Thank you. Uh, any further questions from the committee? Seeing none, I will go on to our next presenter. And thank you very much, Ms. Pitverchinsky, for your presentation and, and taking the time to speak to us today. Uh, our next presenter is uh, Ms. Crystal Lenny. Uh, Ms. Lenny, the, the line is yours. Go ahead. Thank you. Just give me a minute to see if I can share my screen. And Please let me know if you can see my presentation. We can see your presentation now, Ms. Lynn. Go ahead. Okay, great. So good day, my name is Crystal Lenny and I'm an Inuvialuit beneficiary born and raised in Inuvik Northwest Territories. I am happy to be here today to give my perspective on the need to hire local Indigenous people. I would like to make a disclaimer as I am a member of the public service. What I am giving you is a history of my current struggle to obtain a management position within the government of the Northwest Territories. So the views presented are my own. I have entitled my presentation, Breaking the Ice, as I believe the GNWT needs to hire local Indigenous people in government management and senior management positions. As mentioned in the previous slide, I'm an Inuvialuit beneficiary, and within the Inuvialuit final agreement, one of the basic goals expressed is that the Inuvialuit are to be equal and meaningful participants in the Northern and national economy and society. And I believe this includes employment within the government of the Northwest Territories, as the government is the major employer within most of the communities within the Northwest Territories. My hope for this committee when they do their work is that they take a holistic approach, a critical investigation into the Indigenous recruitment and retention within the government of the Northwest Territories. Look at the number of people accessing income security programs, food banks, harvesters assistance programs, and any other government or Indigenous government supplementary funding to make a living within our NWT communities. Look at who's working within the NWT governments and industry and taking a critical look at salary levels 
and position levels between different demographics, Northern Indigenous, non-Indigenous and Southern Indigenous. Look at who's applied on, what position within government, who is hired and ask why. Also check to see who has appealed the competition and outcome of the appeal. Also check who is directly appointed, who is given their position without a formal competition, who is acting in their position. Ask, could a local Northern Indigenous person be given this opportunity? Look at the actual cost of living to paint a picture of what is happening in the Northwest Territories and who is spending money here. The Inuit Health Survey from 2008 found that 43.8% of Inuvialuit surveyed identified as being food insecure. The food insecurity highlights a lack of economy and Indigenous employment within the Northwest Territories. An example is when Mervyn Grubin, who is the former mayor of Tuktoyak, talks about his decisions in the Canadian Arctic and lack of economy. In CBC News, when he is quoted saying, we are supposed to be consulted with equal say on land and water in our region. And yes, this was just thrown in, blanketed, the whole Arctic here. I really think that it's just going to keep our people on social assistance. How do we get ahead? Another example is when Shauna Morgan wrote the article entitled The True Pro Price of Resource Economy in Canada's North. In it, she says, yet despite the tens of millions of dollars spent by government and industry partners on training programs for Northerners over the past 15 years, unemployment rates have not improved. Since the employment rates have not changed, this is an indicator that no one is hiring our local people. I was once told by an assistant deputy minister on the plane that the leadership development program was a pool from which the GNWT chooses its deputy ministers and assistant deputy ministers from. However, since it seems that more than a few Indigenous people have completed this program, they have since made this a null requirement and a null program. I have a Bachelor of Science, a Diploma in Business Administration, a Certificate in Aboriginal Leadership and Management Excellence from the BAM Centre, all three streams of the GNWT Leadership Development Program, a Queen's University Executive Education Queen's Governance Program, along with many short-term certificates, and I am still unable to obtain a manager or senior manager level position within the government of the Northwest Territories. In November of last year, I have just completed my 10th year of long service. I have applied on more than 20 positions in which I have been screened out from or never given opportunity to interview for. Either the position is canceled for which I apply for, and then it is put out as an expression of interest. I have been emailed by a director asking if I was interested in a position within environmental impact assessment after I've applied for that exact position that was posted by the GNWT and I was never given an interview for. Although I sat on the environmental impact review board and took two years of board training along with cumulative effects training at an IAIA conference in Australia. As I previously mentioned, I also hold a Bachelor of Science. So I thought I would at least get an interview. I have also applied for the dire director level position for the division I currently work in. I've been working in this division for seven years and I was screened out. I even wrote a 10 page appeal for the position and my appeal was thrown out by the hiring committee. The interview process may be challenging for Indigenous person, but and probably should be reviewed to ensure there are no barriers to successful hiring. Uh, but I wouldn't know that because I've never been given a chance to interview so far yet. Um, which is why I asked to sit on this Zoom call for this committee to ask why a seemingly educated Indigenous Northerner is not given the opportunity to interview for and obtain a manager and or senior manager level position within our government. 
An issue that is always brought up by the GNWT hiring committees is that the reason I'm screened out of competition is that I do not have the supervisor experience. But my questions are, why is it when a degreed non-Indigenous from the South is given a position, they're not screened out for lack of supervisory experience? They're just given the position and oftentimes directly appointed through the process. They do not meet the criteria for hiring within the government policies. The government offers managerial training to their managers, to which I'm unable to access because I'm not a manager. But shouldn't that be a consideration that they can train me for the position since they're already offering the training? But what it really comes down to is they're not taking my education and experience into consideration when screening for the positions. I have sat on the International Union for Circumpolar Health, the Canadian Institute for Health Research Institute Advisory Board for Aboriginal People's Health, the Environmental Impact Review Board, the National Inuit Committee on Health, which are all high level advisory boards. My time at the school board working on labor relations issues and hiring and doing the reference checks and job offers should count towards experience. Also, my current position where I indirectly have influenced the training and certification of 125 water operators within the Northwest Territory should count towards experience. I have supervised some summer students that should count as well. What also is not looked at is the negotiated funds that I've secured for through the Aboriginal Health Human Resources Initiative and the Aboriginal Health Transition Form Fund for which long-term programming took place. This would have been highlighted if I were given an opportunity to do an interview. Instead of the weak, get out of jail free card, oh, she doesn't have supervisor experience. Well, everyone who is a supervisor has had to start somewhere. With my education in the business administration program, I have been trained in human resources. This also is not considered. They're not considering my regional, national and international experience, working with academia, territorial and federal governments and, inter and international committees. These experiences would benefit the government of the Northwest Territories if I were given an opportunity to display my knowledge, education, and experience. So you might wonder now, why is she asking this question? And I'm going to read the question um, for MLA Marcellos because I noticed she's on the phone. And the question is, is this government interested in hiring Northern Indigenous people? Well, you take a look at the education levels within the NWT communities and the credentials and qualifications for positions on your job competitions, and there is a disconnect. There is no reason why this government couldn't invest in the job training similar to that of the Community Health Aid Program in Alaska, where they hire people and train them on the job to be community health practitioners, the doctor's eyes, hands within their community, similar to a nursing position. This is just one example of how the, the system can accommodate and adapt to their own needs. So to recap, within the Inuvialuit final agreement, one of the basic goals expressed is that Inuvialuit are to be equal and meaningful participants in the Northern and national economy and society. In order to ensure that the territorial government is fulfilling its goal with Indigenous governments and allowing their beneficiaries to be equal and meaningful participants within the Northwest Territories, it needs to address the disconnection between education levels and government hiring practices within the NWT. It may need to recognize that they are the major employer within the NWT, and if they're not hiring local Indigenous, then there is no economy within the North. And then there's possibility of creating a society dependent on government social programming. This committee also needs to look at who's working in the NWT within governments and industry and taking a critical look at salary levels between the position levels between the different demographics and ask why the numbers are low when it comes to Indigenous people holding senior management positions within the government of the Northwest Territories. 
Kriyanaini, Masi, and thank you. And then I'm going to end the slideshow and just show you, since I'm still sharing my screen, that this is the time that I took to appeal the director level position within my division. And it was thrown out by the hiring committee where I went against the competition and put my experience and had my cover lever, letter and resume. So it just highlights that yes, the onus is on the employee and yes, I did my homework, but it still gets thrown out. Um, so I'm going to see if I can stop sharing and thank you for the opportunity to present to the committee. Thank you very yeah. much for your presentation, Ms. Danny. And it's greatly appreciated. I'll uh, open the floor to any questions from uh, committee members. Here, I have a question. Go ahead, Emily Martinez. Uh, thank you for the presentation, uh, 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 Crystal. Uh, I was uh, touched by the work that you put into it. And um, so one of the things that uh, I, I want to mention to you is that you talked about direct appointments, you talked about you want a holistic approach, which it has to happen because neutrality is not there. Uh, I hear it all the time. You know, uh, people are all, they, they know who's going to get the job before it goes out for competition. I don't know if you hear that, but I've heard that many times from people that are knocking at the door here. One of the other things is that, um, you know, uh, 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 do you feel that you, uh, because you uh, were vocal about your concern, uh, do you feel that you're kind of branded now because uh, yeah, of these concerns when uh, they're, even though they're legitimate? Like, uh, I'm uh, very much uh, in favor of Indigenous hires, especially with the P1s and P2s. And uh, everybody else is, uh, to me, is... Uh, no, uh, they're employees, but they're not. Uh, they're not indigenous, and they. I, I always take the part with the indigenous because we are over fifty percent, and also of the people that were all born here. And um, and it doesn't. Re our our, our uh, public service is not reflecting that. And obviously, you have uh, uh, credentials and uh, the governance from Queens and all these other things that count. And um, I wonder how you feel about that. Do you feel like because you've done that now that you'll never get into management? Like to, I'd like you to uh, answer that, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, Ms. Lenny. I actually do feel that um, I've applied on 20 plus positions within the government trying to move up. And that is the common messaging back is there get out of jail free I don't have supervisory experience so um, we don't have to look at your resume um, I have put in uh, 10 years of experience and the current job that I have I actually had to apply for twice um, I have been working on getting my education at the same time as working so that I can make myself a competitive uh, person within the job application. Um, but I don't know, it, and like Desiree brought forward, it is a lot of, at the dis discretion of the hiring department. And, and like I said, I applied for uh, an, an environmental coordinator position, which I was sat on the review board for two two terms and took cu cumulative effects assessment and, and took the board training um, because we were getting ready for review. And you would think that that would all be taken into consideration along with the Bachelor of Science. Um, weren't, and <laughs> I get an email from the director saying, oh, did you want to work in this field? <laughs> Well, yes, I applied on the formal process and went through the, took the time to do my resume and application. 
and that was the email back that I got. Um, I think that it, it, and I can't pull forward those the, the stats that I question that you guys should be looking at, but I wish I, I hope that you would is who who's in those positions, who's directly appointed, who applied for them, and why wasn't their opportunity given? Thank you, Ms. Lanky. Uh, any further questions from committee? Emily Cleveland? Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much to Ms. Lenny for the presentation. Uh, your presentation was incredible, and and I just want to to reflect some things that um, that Ms. Lenny said. One of the things she spoke about was on the job training. You are so incredibly well educated and have gone out of your way to sit on boards and gain, uh, you know, the additional certifications both within and outside of the the GNWT. It's, your resume is incredible. You also made a comment about uh, making yourself more competitive. Your resume must be just from from the outside looking in, imagining what your resume looks like, given your presentation today. Your resume is incredible. Um, and, and you've done that work, which is also incredible, having done it as well um, as at the same time as being a public servant. And so I just wanted to reflect, on, you've, you've done that work. And so I'm wondering, given the extensive work that you've also done as, as part of the appeals process, that process obviously did not work and did not serve um, the function it is meaning to serve. And so given your experience working through that appeals process, I'm wondering if Ms. Lenny would be willing to speak to what a vision of what an effective appeals process could look like. Thank you. Go ahead, Ms. Lenny. Um, it, it may not be the, I, I feel that I, it shouldn't have come to an appeals process. I feel that if the affirmative action policy was working the way it was intended to work, I wouldn't have had to go through the appeals process. Um, if if the policy was hired, um, it would be wonderful if the uh, appeals process was followed and taken into consideration. Um, as I reflected the work and experience as per the job description, um, but it still wasn't looked at. So it comes down to the discretion of the hiring department and the the will to move Indigenous, educated Indigenous people forward within government. Thank you, Ms. Lenny. Uh, any further questions from the committee? Uh, Emily Sumner. Thank you for your presentation. Ms. Lani, um, one of the things that, you know, since when I first got elected, I, um, the Indigenous Career Gateway wasn't being utilized as much. Um, there were still funds in it when we first got elected and we were partway through the year. Um, once we started raising it in the house and pushing it publicly, those dollars started to get accessed by departments. Another one that they have is the Indigenous Management Development Program. Um, and from our understanding in some of our presentations, that's way underutilized. And have you ever applied or been offered by your any of your employers through the GNWT to, to obtain that training? I've requested it and it hasn't been actioned. Okay. And the response that I got back is that if you're going to offer the training, you should offer an, offer a position to go with it. Okay. Follow up, Emily. Summer. Yeah. No. And I and I thank you for that answer because, like I said, I do know that there are it is this is public, and I want you know people that have act, tried to access indigenous people of the Northwest Territories who are trying to access some of these dollars are being denied to being accessed and they're still there and they're underutilized um, and that goes to the statement that you made is how are we supposed to get supervisory experience or any type of 
thing to move forward if we're not being able to take the tools that are even being developed for us. So I thank you for your presentation. And I hope that, you know, before the end of this two years that we can start to steer the ship in, in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, of the committee, thank you very much for your presentation, Ms. Lenny. It was, it was greatly appreciated. And I, I believe committee will try and track down those statistics and, and get into some of the specific hiring. That is, that is one of our priorities following this. Uh, with that, our next presenter tonight is uh, Ms. Packenham. I hope I'm saying that right. And uh, with that, I'll turn the floor over to you. Um, yeah, you did say it correct. Um, so uh, my name is Catherine. I work as the justice manager for the Foster Family Coalition. Um, so I primarily work with uh, youth between the ages of 15 and 24. Um, so I can't really speak so much to indigenous retention, but um, more to the hiring aspect. Um, as I'm sure it will come to no surprise that almost all of the youth in the foster care system are indigenous. Um, and uh, the youth in my program have all uh, had a brush with the law. Um, and I would really like to uh, re-emphasize the point that Desiree made about the equivalencies. Many of the youth that I have have had, have been in foster care almost their entire lives and have had little stability in their living arrangements. Um, they've had dozens of placements uh, and so academic pursuits kind of fell to the wayside, uh, understandably. And so many of them have had no support in completing secondary schooling, um, but have had a lot of experience um, participating in the activities that, you know, Foster Family Coalition or this, that social services would have provided them with. And so many of them have informal experience and talents that I believe would serve the GNWT well, but that would not be considered because they haven't had the support they needed to complete any any secondary schooling. And as Mr. Um, Mr. Nelner pointed out that, um, you know, the more that we spend on Indigenous hiring and retention, the less will be put into the justice program, because particularly the, the, the young adults in my program, the, the struggles that they face is, you know, they can't, they have, no, they don't have the ability to go back to school while also paying all of their bills, um, because they just have, they just don't have the support systems in place to, to do that. So, that's my main point. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ms. Pagnan, for making that point. And I think that coincides with uh, work being done that I know you have contributed to with uh, a review of the Child and Family Services works. So, uh, I will open the floor up to any questions from MLA. Go ahead, Lisa. Yeah, um, thank you for that. Um, I know that this is something that we've 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 raised and we've heard um, and a, a lot of it is based on you know like when Mr. Nelner did his presentation the the men indigenous male hiring is very low in the Northwest Territories and then you look at like you said a lot of the kids have had brushes with the law so as soon as they see a lot of times the people see is criminal record check but I don't think that's the thing is there's at some point, you know, if they were a youth offender or, you know, or, you know, they turned 18 and, you know, they, they got an assault charge because they got in a fight or, you know, and then they become 24, 25 and they're starting to get their life on track and, and they go to apply for these entry level jobs, even with these entry level jobs, just to answer a phone, you need, you need your grade 12. And then you need two years experience. So that goes back to that experience again, where there's just, you know, there's this, and then if you, you could either go to this casual pool, which you just get overlooked because your resume doesn't have really much on it. So it's, it's overlooked. Um, how do you, what recommendations could you, do you think like, and I know like one of the things that we as MLA said is, job descriptions are way overinflated. Like they're way, 
they have way too much stuff on them and they screen everybody out. So, you know, you'd bring a job, one of those jobs, and then you're leaving it up to a manager who sometimes doesn't work outside a box, you know, like there's people who could, you know, okay, well, you're great. I'm going to give you a try, even though this resume or this, the job description says you need to have this, 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 but not everybody works like that. And so how do we, what recommendations do you think that we, it, for us to help, especially with entry level? Um, so I would really recommend the, the on the job training that was mentioned earlier. Um, I've also heard that um, Deshinta might be creating some programming for um, ECE, um, which I think would be really great because all of the all of the kids in my program really want more access to on the land programming um and if they were able to get some kind of experience that they could use to leverage into a job um whether that counted for high school credit or um one of the programs that we might be creating is just seeing if we can volunteer get them to volunteer to get their community service hours um but if there was um, I really think that that program would be incredibly beneficial. Um, I've worked um, with a couple of the, the people from Dishinja. We'll be doing a lot of programming with them. And the understanding that they have of how to help these youth gain the skills that they would need to, to become employable and also just to help them kind of flourish in adulthood. Um, I think is really wonderful and that that should be promoted more extensively. Thank you, Ms. Packman. Uh, any further follow-up questions from committee? Hearing none, just on behalf of committee, thank you for presenting today and all of the work you do at your program with the Foster Family Co Coalition. Uh, we appreciate all of your insights. Uh, and our final presenter for tonight is representatives from the Fort Smith May team. And with that, I will turn it over to you, President Harris. Thank you. You know, this is really interesting. It's nice to hear people talk about the problems that they're having within government <clears throat> and the hiring policies that are in place. Well, I'm not just talking for one individual. I'm talking for the our community, our Métis people in the community here in Fort Smith. And I'd like to know what recruitment efforts have been made to recruit Indigenous pe people in our community? And how many Indigenous people are working in the government of the Northwest Territories? What are their positions? How many mentorship programs are in place so that Indigenous people can get up in government. You hear people talking about they can't get a job, they need this, they need that. Well, government should really look at their programs and see how they can make it better for the Indigenous people that are really trying. Not just go sit in a corner for 25 years or so. You know, if they have the education. If they don't, send them to school. That's what they have an education program for. How many people did the government use that went through the, the school system and the nursing, the teaching that we have, that are we using? Very little. You know, the government really has to look at their programs that they have in place. And what evidence does the government use to verify self-identified candidates as indigenous people? You know, that's another thing, you know, that's lacking that. I mean, there's so many things that are going wrong in government and it's not the first time the standing committee or any other committee I've heard from people with how wrong government and, and, and not doing right by the people that they represent, you know, it, it, it's, uh, it, it's sad. You know, there's, uh, and what is the reasoning behind hiring individuals after they retire and move down south and then still work for, for the government? You know, 
isn't there people in the north that can that live here have that right to get these jobs instead of giving them to, out to people that don't even live in the north anymore you know these are very serious uh, questions that we have it's affecting our community how many manager positions have moved out of Fort Smith from this government to different locations but yet still come back to work here they take the jobs out of here and bring them to another community. You know, we're a small community of 2,500 people. Majority of, the, of this community are Aboriginal people, 55 to 60%. And we're struggling to get work. That is wrong. And why it's wrong is because there's no mentorship programs in place. You know, like I, like I, I listen to these people talk tonight, and, and there's a concern. And the government, you people are MLAs looking after our communities. You should hear what we have to say. Take it to heart. And I have uh, one of my uh, members would like to say a few things also. His name is Kevin Heron. Good evening and uh, thanks for listening to us. It's uh, amazing that Aboriginal people are always the ones that we have these forums and hearings on. You never hear these things happening for any other group of people, but except Aboriginal people. The government of the Northwest Territories has an affirmative action policy. That policy has been in place. And the reason we're here tonight is there's people within the government system that are not following that policy and they follow it they don't follow it and they have no consequences. They just do it and they do it over and over. There's people sitting in this room whose family members have been denied jobs, well-educated people, uh, people whose parents worked for 30, 40 years for the government of the Northwest Territories, yet their children are not deemed to be able to get these jobs. We, the Portsmouth Métis Local, are working with are going to be working with the other Métis organizations, uh, Fort Res and Hay River, and, and we're going to get a statement put out. But what we want to do is we want to deal with this, uh, the systematic racism within the government of the Northwest Territories around the government hiring practices. Affirmative action policies being ignored and direct appointments and transfers show that the government human resource practices need to be reviewed immediately. And in some cases, there's got to be demotions or in, if people that just will not follow these policies or not, totally ignore them, there has to be Fire. severely consequences such as dismissal because we can't have these hearings here year after year and no action happening. Members of the, we, we ask that the government review its policies and determine where racial and cultural bias exists, which includes the ex examination of policies related to government hiring. We're just putting this together so that we can share it. You gotta, it doesn't flow the way we should yet. Many Métis do not bring these issues forward because they feel defeated or that future opportunities will not be available to them. The government must be accountable and to more to eliminate systematic racism. Métis are at a disadvantage and are being against, uh, uh, discriminated against. The Fort Smith Métis Council will will support and ensure Métis can gain meaningful employment with the government of the Northwest Territories. We are prepared to, we are pre prepared to appeal government jobs on our members' behalf because our members are scared. They don't want to go out there and they don't want to rock the boat, you know, and, and we, uh, we're there. We have to get that fixed. And there you are. One of the things that has to happen is HR has got to, HR has got to go out and they got to phone the applicants. They got to say, are you an indigenous Aboriginal person? When they have those people in there, there should be not any, any interviews given to P3s. They should be going through the P2s and the, P, the P1s and 2s and giving it to the people who reside and make the North their home. P3s typically come because they're somebody's relative and they're getting a job. We have to make sure that any transfer assignment or any direct appointment has involvement 
of at least a deputy minister's involvement, but more importantly, it should involve the Aboriginal organizations in the group. The Fort Smith Métis Council, the president, should be aware that there's a direct appointment and HR should be able to ask, answer the questions that, the, uh, that will be asked why and, and not done there. There should be a commission set up, somebody that can work and get these things cleared or under, because we can't go on having hearings, 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 and not give any action to the Aboriginal people of the Northwest Territories around jobs. We have to be able to protect employees from... When there's equivalencies for these jobs, quite often the, the, uh, app, the applicant is told you're overqualified or you're underqualified, there's nothing in there. But yet the person who comes in from some other place in Canada comes in and typically doesn't have the experience. They end up learning from the average of people that are working there. And they're the ones that go directly into a, into a supervisory position. They're also the ones that are going to take advantage of the education leave because the person that's the manager that brought them in is typically a friend or a relative. So they give them the opportunity to get education, further their education on the GNWD dollar, the taxpayer's dollar. They get that and they're educated. So then they keep moving up the ladder because they give them these opportunities because who they are and the friends they receive. And uh, there has to be a point where we can get involved and there has to be a point where we can call out when these people are doing it. But more importantly, there's got to be the consequences when a person does not give the Aboriginal the job. We've heard this how many times here tonight that people are, are being denied these jobs, but there's nothing happening to the people that are allowing that to happen. There's no consequences out there. And the consequence that's going to make the change is going to be dismissal. And if anybody else on the board wants to talk, feel free. I want to say one more thing about the affirmative action. The affirmative action was set up so the Aboriginal people can get a right to get a job. Education qualification, that's important. I know years ago, like I, I worked for the territorial government for 35 years. I've been retired for uh, 17 now. And I sat on that affirmative action board years ago. I also sat on uh, recruitment of staff here in Smith. There was always a Métis person or a First Nations person sitting at that table when they were screening applicants, when they were hiring, when they were interviewing. You make them feel the people that are coming in for an interview, they know who you are in that room. They're not scared. They don't have to be intimidated by other people that they don't know. That's so important to the Aboriginal people. Normally, Aboriginal people are shy and quiet. They don't like to talk. They're kind of nervous to talk. And they need that. They need that in the affirmative action when they're hiring and screening applicants. Thank you. And when there is an appeal on the job, there should be a board put together that is outside of the HR HR's mandate. It's got to be some neutral people to do that appeal right. because there's people in the system that know how to manipulate it and, and make it look like they did their job. But can you name us any appeal that was overturned in a person given the job? I don't, I don't remember hearing one in that. So there, there has to be some real changes and you've got to get the Aboriginal organizations involved in these changes because Having a talk like this tonight, uh, you know, we don't want it to be meaningless, but if you don't sit down with us and start taking some of the concerns that we have, I know in our community, we have good support from our MLA, but there has to be a united front to go against these things because it can get pretty dirty when you're gonna go out there and, and say that there's racism involved. And, uh, but racism is a two way street, you know, it's typically against the Aboriginal people. Thank you. On behalf of committee, I would just like to thank you, President Heron, and, and all the members of the Fort Smith Métis Council for, for presenting tonight and being here tonight. And I, I think there is most certainly some uh, further conversations we can have and, and get some responses to your, your specific concerns. 
Uh, uh, with that, I'll, I'll open up the floor to any questions or comments from committee members. But, uh, I got some comments, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, Emily Martellos. Yeah, first of all, I want to thank the Fort Smith AD for taking the time. Uh, even it was in the 11th hour, uh, I'm glad you got on the schedule, and uh, I think your presentation was was true and uh, honest, and it came from the heart. I have been involved with uh, different uh, uh, applications that uh, for people who did not get the job uh, that were of Indigenous descent, and some of them were Métis, and uh, some people lost their jobs because uh, people were asking for master's degrees. And I went back, I don't know how many times, with uh, uh, this incredible candidate. Um, and um, was, uh, always, there was always that, uh, that barrier, that wall. Nobody could understand why we wanted to keep this person in the system where she was. And um, I understood and um, it was uh, it was heartbreaking, and we shouldn't have to be doing that, especially when they have the equivalencies. You know, how do you tell someone you don't have a job no more when you're an indigenous person and you've been in the job for more than 15 years and have done an incredible job? So you know, I uh, my heart goes out and. Um, you know, I got up in the, uh, the house and gave, uh, I started this, this conversation on Indigenous hires because uh, I know that uh, systemic racism is part of it. And uh, I, um, I'll continue to do that on behalf of the community of Fort Smith. And, um, and I want to thank you for uh, a terrific, honest, and sincere uh, presentation. I don't have any questions because I mean we're just you can come into my office at any time to express what you want to say and you know uh, the notes tonight that uh, are taken hopefully uh, that I, I know the HR department are probably watching and uh, they know where I am I where I stand and always will stand and uh, and that's with the people of Fort Smith especially the P1s and the P2s like uh, uh, Mr. Heron said. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Emily Marcellos. Uh, if anyone in the Fort Smith Métis Council would care to respond or have any comments, the floor is yours. Well, yeah, I, I, like again, I, I want to thank you. It was interesting to hear from different people of the of the NWT, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, we seeing what the government uh, does. You know, I'll give you an example. Wood Buffalo National Park is a federal government. We have a seat on their hiring. We have a seat on their all the recruitment. And you know, it was hard to break that because they brought in all their friends. Instead of hiring people that finish in this Arwood program at the college, we even asked them to go do presentations, get these kids involved, you know. But they never did. So now, the Forceman Media Council, we are involved in the screening, we're involved in this uh, interviews, we're involved in the selection. And it took many, many years to get that, but we are there now. And the territorial government has to do the same. Thank you. President Aaron, that, that, that's a great example of you know, something actionable that we could implement and, and try and bring to the GNWT that similar oversight. Uh, any other further questions from committee? Are you also going to be looking at the hiring practices of, say, uh, the colleges and stuff like that, where, where there, there could be problems also? Like, say, local uh, here enforcement, of course, Aurora College. At the end of the day, the paychecks come from the government of the Northwest Territories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe uh, many of the same Public Service Act requirements and GNW hiring requirements apply to the college. So that is uh, 
uh, we will take your suggestion and, and look into that further. Yeah. Any further questions from committee? No, we're good. Uh, Mr. Chair, can I just comment on that with the college? Go ahead, MLA Martellus. Yeah, I think our, our day will come right, uh, to Fort Smith, and I think that's a good question to ask uh, from the Fort Smith Maintain Nation. Uh, he'll meet with all the groups when he comes. It'll be probably after session now because of the outbreak here in Fort Smith. Um, there has to be similar oversight at the college. Uh, this is an example. I I was going to leave. Uh, uh, I was of course, everybody knows I was chief of Salt River. I was going to leave chief. Uh, the uh, I left the, uh, the uh, leadership for a year because of various reasons, and uh, I applied for a job at the college that was just at uh, middle management. wasn't even really senior management. I didn't even get an interview. Yet I could build a, a $20 million building in town here and build all these businesses and do all these other things, which are all management in private industry. I didn't even get an interview. No, I, I just couldn't believe it. And I didn't appeal because I thought, well, what's the use? Obviously, uh, they must have a friend that they want to give that job to. And the person who got it, I mean, they, could, they can't build $20 million buildings here. So there's, there's, there's problems all over the place. And oversight is very important. I will make sure that uh, when we get briefings on, uh, on the new policy that... Uh, I will make sure that um, I'll have a say in some of those things. Uh, and I want to thank you for bringing that forward, uh, Mr. Heron. Uh, thank you, Emily Marcellus. And uh, on behalf of the committee, I would like to thank all of the presenters tonight. Uh, I think this was a, a very informative public hearing. It was uh, full of people's personal experience, and I'm very happy to hear uh, you know, us beginning this conversation. For anyone who's uh, not on this Zoom call and may be watching, uh, please feel free to reach out with presentations in writing, or if you wish to make a similar presentation to committee, you can get in contact with us. And uh, with that, I will adjourn the public portion of this hearing. I would uh, ask that uh, members stay on the line for a rapid discussion. Thank you, everyone.